Hello and welcome back to this Amiga game programming series. In previous episode I explained my reasons and intentions and in this one we'll discuss tools that will be used for developing. When I started learning Amiga assembly I used ASM Pro natively on Amiga emulator. It's quite powerful and has great support for debugging. However, it has a couple downsides. For example, if you disable system, which is normal for a game, you can no longer debug as system isn't responding to keyboard and mouse input. And if your game crashes, which it almost certainly will at one point or another, there's big chance it will take down the rest of the system as well, resulting in the famous guru meditation. Then it would take some time to restore back to previous point, even when using emulator. Nothing really deal-breaking, of course. I guess just whining of a spoiled developer of sorts. Even so, I wanted to write the program in the comfort of modern code editor with all the bells and whistles last 30 years brought. I use Visual Studio Code as my editor of choice, so it was no brainer when I discovered Amiga Assembly plugin for it. It provides support for debugging, stepping through the program and inspecting registers and variables and so on. It uses Vasm Assembler under the hood and it's cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows, Linux or macOS. Regardless, the code should be quite portable, so if you want to follow along coding yourself, feel free to use whichever editor you prefer. I used Example Workspace Bundle as project starting point. It conveniently sets up all required files and hooks, so you can simply start coding. However, before we actually begin, I wanted to set up include files with commonly used Amiga registers for CIA, complex interface adapter, custom chips, as well as library functions. With this, coding can finally start. First thing, we want to establish the main game loop. The application is divided into three parts. It starts with initialization, then enters the main loop until end condition is reached and finally cleans everything up. Before starting main loop, we want to initialize the game. We usually want to disable operating system while our game is running. This is what disable system subroutine will do. Before exiting our game, we have to restore the system to its original state. The first subroutine we'll write is checking for end condition. When game will be implemented, this will use player actions, but for now we just want some way of stopping sessions. So we check for escape key press. To check for escape, we need to read current keyboard state from corresponding register. This is one byte of which seven are describing key code and one key up or down flag. Codes transmitted to the computer are rotated one bit though, with up down flag on bit zero. Just one of peculiarities of Amiga hardware programming. First, we rotate the byte one bit to the right. This moves up down flag to bit eight and all other bits one down, which allows us to compare with desired key code directly. As if that was not enough, all bits are also negated, requiring not instruction to get the correct value. So now we can compare with desired key code. For escape key, this is 45 hex. Note in this case our comparison will work for key down state. If we'd want to wait for key up, we need to add 80 hex to key code value to compensate for up down flag being set. Now we can end our program, so it's time to implement remaining subroutines. First, disabling the system. Move M instruction means move many. It is used to save current values of all or any given subset of registers to stack. We need this so we can restore original values when done. Every processor has limited set of registers. These are special locations that are quickly accessible to central processing unit or CPU. While we can also use arbitrary variables, some instructions and system functions expect parameters to be passed or results delivered through registers. Therefore, they are important real estate when programming in assembly. 68000 comes with spacious 8 data registers and 8 address registers, all conveniently 32 bits in length. Even so, it's still easy to run out of them or accidentally overwriting values if not taking care. Therefore, I tend to use this save restore technique frequently, especially during initialization and cleanup, where performance doesn't matter that much. 
At the same time, this allows changing subroutine order without having to think which registers will be affected. Next step is to open graphics library so we can save current copper pointer. We will change copper to point to our list later on, so we need to restore it back to original when finishing. This block is typical way of opening system libraries on Amiga. First, we need to get the address of exec base into an address register, A6 in our case. Exec base is located at constant address on all systems. Next, we need to prepare the parameters for library call. This depends on the library function being called. Open library expects library name in A1 and library version in D0. When all is set up, we jump to subroutine. Keynight observers may notice different syntax compared with previous jumps. So far, we only use direct jumps, but that's just one of 12 addressing modes of 68000 processor. In this case, we use so-called register indirect with displacement mode. It's certainly mouthful, but no worries, it's quite simple. It requires setting up base address in one of address registers, A6 in our case, and then takes relative offset from this address. It's quite common addressing mode, especially when it comes to data structures. You'll see me using it all over the place. Note we use old open library function. This function is provided for compatibility with 1.0 release of the Amiga system, which had incorrect version of open library function that did not check version number. It always used latest version available. For this program, we could just as well use open library as we explicitly set version with D0 register. In fact, old open library is exactly the same as calling open library and setting D0 register to 0. Open library function returns base address of the library in D0 register. First thing, we copy it to address register, so we can again use register indirect with displacement addressing mode to access copper pointer value, which we then copy to our variable. After this, we're done with graphics library, and as good Amica citizens, we need to close it. Note close library function expects pointer to library in A1 register. That's why we chose A1 in the first line of this block. We move the value from D0 to address register and conveniently set the stage for closing library with single instruction. Besides copper pointer, we also need to store original values of interrupt enable and direct memory access or DMA control words. But this we can simply read from corresponding custom chip registers as shown here. The final step is setting up interrupts and DMA control words for our use. For all of this, bit 15 is used as set clear control bit. It determines if bits written with 1 get set or cleared. Bits written with a 0 are always unchanged. That's why we typically need to first disable all by using control bit of 0 and all remaining ones set to 1, and then repeat instruction with control bit set to 1 and enabling just desired features by setting corresponding bits to 1. First two lines handle interrupt enable, followed by interrupt request and finally DMA setup. Note at this point we only really set DMA bits, so we wouldn't need repeating interrupt enable and interrupt request instructions. But I nonetheless set up everything so code is ready if we do need interrupts in the future. Before exiting our game, we have to restore the system to its original state. Again, we store current register values to stack so we can restore them before returning. To restore values, we use reversed order from system disables subroutine. First line disables all direct memory access control bits. And in second line, we restore original DMA value. Again, these control words work by using bit 15 as set clear bit which determines if remaining bits with value of 1 should be set or cleared. Therefore, we must first disable all before setting the values. This time we use hex value instead of binary. 7 FFF hex equals to 0 followed by 14 ones in binary, meaning we reset all DMA control bits. Next, we restore copper list pointer. Conveniently, even though 68000 is 16 bit processor, Amiga allows addressing 32 bits of memory. Therefore, each location needs to be specified as 32-bit address. As all custom chip control words are 16 bits, 
We typically need to use two to point to concrete memory location. For copper we have COP1 LCH and COP1 LCL for high and low words. However, whenever control words represent 32-bit address, they are always conveniently set up to follow each other in memory. This allows us to use single move L instruction that copies all 32 bits. Now that's nice, isn't it? Note we should always wait until vertical refresh before changing copper lists. We'll implement this part shortly. We'll also talk more about copper in a future episode, but for now suffice to say it's a mega coprocessor and can control many different areas. It executes its commands as video beam moves down the screen, so we should not change its list until the beam starts moving back to top, otherwise it may end up in inconsistent state. Finally, we restore interrupts, making sure master interrupt bit is set and restore all registers. And here are all variables that are used to store original values while our program is running. As mentioned earlier, we need to wait for vertical screen refresh before we can change copper pointer. Let's implement this now. We will use two custom chip registers for reading current beam position. These are VPOSR and VHPOSR, both 16 bits length as all custom chip registers. And again, we can treat them as single 32-bit value, which will simplify processing a bit. Here you can see bit representation of both registers. Vertical position uses 9 bits and can represent every single line. However, horizontal position only uses 8 bits, so it can't represent every pixel, even in low resolution mode of 320 pixels. Highlighted line establishes bit mask in D2 register. We are only interested in vertical position here, so this will be used to mask the rest of the bits out. On the right side, at the bottom, you can see how the value exactly matches all 9 bits of vertical position. Bottom 16 bits of D0 register represent vertical position we want to wait for. However, we can't directly compare with the value from custom chip registers, because vertical position is offset 8 bits to the left. Therefore, we shift input 8 bits to the left to compensate for vertical bits. Afterwards, we use previously prepared mask in D2 register to clear all bits except those representing vertical position. While this may seem unnecessary, we only require bottom word of D0 to be set for the subroutine. This means upper word may contain garbage which may interfere with comparison later on. Masking it ensures we compare on equal terms. After we've arranged our desired position in D0, we start the loop that continuously reads beam position until the value matches. First, we read current beam position into D1. This fills in both vertical and horizontal values, so we need to clear out all bits except vertical position. We again use mask in D2 register we prepared at start. Now both input and current values can be directly compared and as long as the value doesn't match, we stay in the loop. All right, let's see what we have done. You can't really see it on video, but we can launch the game and we can end it by pressing escape key. Now, that's exciting, isn't it? Well, okay, it's just a screen full of gray. I give you that. But it's a start and the program does exactly what we instructed it to, so that's good in my book. At this point we're ready with the initial implementation of our game. But before moving on, let's take care of another aspect of programming, version control. I always use version control system to keep track of changes to source files, even for private programs. I think the benefits greatly overcome potential overhead of using it. Version control system helps manage project as it changes over time. It keeps track of every change to source files, so if mistake is done, it's easy to compare with earlier versions to help fix it. It also gives more freedom in experimenting, without fearing some changes may be lost in the process. And as additional bonus, it can be used as project backup in a different folder, computer or even remote server. I use Git since its first release most often in command line. Let's initialize a new git repository for this project and add current code to it. 
If you're used to Git, you may wonder what the commands I use represent. I created many command aliases to speed up Git use. See description below for most frequently used ones. Feel free to copy them to your Git config file and modify to suit your needs. All right, at this point we have working game. Well, that may be a bit of an overstatement given what it does, but as said, it's a start. However, no program is set in stone. Even though we just started, there is something I want to address before going on. Currently, all code is located in a single file. This will become quite messy as we'll be adding new code to it. Basm Assembler allows splitting source into multiple files, so let's do that. I want to move system routines into separate file first. Now we need to include this new file to main one so Vasm will be aware of it. We already included some files with commonly used constants at the top. Well, we'll use exactly the same here. Vasm Assembler allows including helper files anywhere in the code. Think of include statements as if the code from the given file is copied at that exact location. The only important thing to keep in mind is generated executable program will start at the first encountered instruction. So if we include some subroutines above our main entry point, that will become the entry point for the program. It's possible to change that, but I like to keep code organized top down, so I'm fine with it. I also moved various hardware related routines into separate file, and this is the final result. Let's also quickly check if the program still works. And it does! We can still launch and end it with escape key. We'll take care of degraying the screen in following episodes, no worries. Let's not forget to add all changes to Git as well. I try to be as informative as possible when describing commit. This can become a useful resource when investigating changes later on. For Git, it's common convention to split commit message into short first line as subject, followed by empty line and then more thorough description, similar to email messages. By this time I also created private repository on GitHub, so I'm pushing all changes to it. I treat this as online backup. If nothing else, it greatly reduces chances of losing my code in case my computer dies. <laughs> or in case I mess something up. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. Perhaps you noticed we have three commits, but I only showed two in the video. I updated Amiga assembly plugin to latest version in between. Unfortunately, my recording didn't work. On the other hand, the only thing worth pointing out about it is that I tend to include not just my source code in Git repository, but also all surrounding files, including all binaries like emulator in this case. While this significantly increases repository size, it allows me to very easily clone the project to different computer and have it compilable immediately, without having to install anything else. It works even if third-party files are no longer available, and I also don't have to hunt for the exact version my code was built with. Ok, we survived the first coding episode. Next time we'll start working on graphics. Exciting! Please like and subscribe if you find this video useful and click that bell button if you want to be notified of upcoming episodes. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye!